So the topic I will go through a very quick introduction on who we are and why we're here and uh, speak about how MVNO model can help generate value in the M2M uh, value chain. So Transatel, we are a uh, French-based company, we're an enabler, uh, 12 years old now, uh, with activity in France, UK, Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg and Switzerland, and our business is to enable more voice and data services, and we work for mobile operators to help them host MVNOs and operate M2M servers, MVNOs, which are alternate uh, mobile operators, and M2M players. Uh, wanting to uh, launch M2M service. Um, and we uh, work with our platform that we have developed over the years, uh, and we have several agreements uh, that I will um, show. Our footprint today in Western Europe is on the following networks, where we have primarily our MVNO business and starting the M2M business. Uh, some of our references, this is historically from the MVNO space, so I won't go through all of them, but those are either prepaid or postpaid MVNOs. Uh, the latest one that should launch before the Olympics here is China Telecom, that's going to target the Chinese community in the UK and tourists from China coming to the UK. On the M2M space, uh, one of our refer references is everything everywhere here in the UK. As was said this morning, operators need uh, an M2M platform to host the M2M services, uh, manage the, um, the SIM estate to build and to provide a portal and APIs and services to the M2M customers. And we happen to have um, developed and we operate the solutions for everything everywhere here uh, in the UK. And uh, moving up the value chain, we have also recently announced uh, an agreement with NEC uh, to develop a middleware uh, to help application providers develop services on top of connectivity management and uh, M2M service management that uh, NEC is bringing on. So that's for the introduction. Now, how can an MVNO model contribute to generate value chain, to generate value for M2M? Well, first, we have looked this morning already to the traditional market segmentation for M2M, and it is industry-based. Uh, you have all the security uh, industry uh, with the surveillance, alarms, etc. The automotive, which is a big uh, growth factor with uh, uh, telematics, uh, uh, emergency services, but also uh, onboard entertainment. You have the healthcare. The energy, we spoke about uh, smart metering, smart grid this morning, uh, public infrastructure, um, uh, industry monitoring, uh, consumer electronics, the e-readers, the gaming devices, etc., and the uh, field and logistics area. That's the classic way of viewing the segmentation based on industry. What we see already emerging is that on one side you have, to, you have the M2M activity, which is data, and on the side you have mobile broadband, which is also data, but is seen as what you use on your smartphone when you have an iPhone and Android and you surf the web, etc. And we see that the frontier between classic M2M and mobile broadband is blurring. Uh, if we take two examples uh, that are recently launched, BMW uh, introduced Connect Drive, which is telematics embarked in the vehicle for the classic uh, services of emergency call, diagnostic, etc. But it also includes internet browsing uh, and even download of content to the back seat screens. So you see that uh, uh, now the, um, the frontier is blurring and 3G in this case is very important because in your car this is the only connectivity you have and you see that usage are not only verticals in the automotive industry. Another example is uh, Sony launching the PlayStation Vita uh, where indeed you can play games and share scores, etc. online, but also use this almost as a, a smartphone to surf the web, uh, uh, go on the social networks, etc. So we see that the difference between traditional machine-to-machine -machine and mobile broadband are, are blurring. Therefore, we propose another way of looking at the segmentation and more towards usage profile. And we see three, uh, three types of, of usage. 
what we can call the classic uh, M2M verticals. It's the uh, M2M appliances, uh, so it's all the sensors, the monitoring, uh, uh, etc., alarms, etc., where the characteristics is that the usage is very predictable uh, and it's a single purpose uh, device. It's mainly low usage. Actually, sometimes it's high usage if you have to download lots of data or update a firmware or something. But at least it's predictable. Uh, and the user has no or little awareness of connectivity. The user is using an alarm service, is getting uh, monitoring uh, for uh, an appliance. Uh, but he doesn't, uh, he's not aware really of the connectivity and in some application the user may not even know if it is going through Wi-Fi, through 3G, through whatever technology. At the other end of the spectrum you have the general purpose and mobile broadband usage which is classic, uh, what we use smartphone data goggles where there the usage is really to go uh, onto the mobile internet uh, and here it's very diversified usage uh, with high data usage and full awareness of the connectivity by the end user because the, this is the purpose of the device. In the middle we uh, find the hybrid model which we can refer to as connected devices and it's precisely the example uh, I gave just earlier of the consumer electronic, the gaming device, the uh, e-readers uh, and the, the in-vehicle entertainment. And here we see variable usage. I can own a BMW and only use, I mean, let the system work its diagnostic without me using, or I can then use the uh, browser to surf the web and look for the next restaurant. So it's variable usage, it's multi-purpose. Uh, so uh, data usage is medium to high, and uh, there is starting to be an awareness of connectivity by the end user. So why is this important? It's because based on, those, on this segmentation, we can define several commercial models between the connectivity provider, which is the mobile operator in the 3G environment, the M2M customer, which is the entity buying or signing with the mobile operator, and the M2M user, which is actually uh, benefiting from a service. On the left side, in the M2M verticals, the supplier is, of course, the mobile operator. The customer is the M2M service provider or the enterprise, whether it's a utility for its smart metering, uh, and a security firm for alarming, for home alarms, for example. And the user is, in effect, benefiting from a service, again, without really knowing that there is connectivity. Uh, in the middle, the hybrid model, the customer is a device manufacturer. It is Sony, it is um, uh, Amazon, people like this. And the user is the consumer that is buying a device. And here, the consumer buys a device, then discovers the connectivity. Uh, and the last classic uh, model, this is classic mobile telephony, the customer is the user, is the consumer, and he's subscribed to a mobile offer. When you go and choose a smartphone, you take the uh, subscription that goes with it, uh, based on your expected needs of bundles or unlimited usage. And on the left, it is a classic business-to-business -business, uh, model. On the right, it's a classic business-to-consumer model. And in the middle, it becomes a business-to-business-to-consumer model, which is very similar to an MVNO model, where an MVNO will buy wholesale to a operator and bundle uh, with a service. And why is that important? If we go through what could be seen as a uh, ideal life cycle when you buy a connected device like this, you go in the shop, you buy a device, you pay maybe an extra 50 or 70 dollars because it has a 3G feature and the promise is to be always connected because you have Wi-Fi and 3G. And when you go home, you open the box, uh, you want it to be fully functional. Um, and so it has to have, and you may not know that it's a SIM, but it has to have a ready-to-go uh, SIM already pre-activated, ready to go. And you may have a trial period uh, to try it on. And in this case, 3G may be even easier to set up than Wi-Fi because you don't even need to go and uh, select uh, your local uh, Wi-Fi, type your uh, password, etc. 
And then once you've used your uh, trial period, uh, or even before you use your trial period, all those connected devices, now you, they force you to register. Uh, when you have a, a PS Vita, you have to register with the Sony um, PlayStation Network. Um, so you, you will register. And at some point, when you finish your trial period, then it's easy for the device to pop up a question saying, do you want more? Do you want to continue? You tried it. Do you want to subscribe or to pay for, for content? And the one-stop shopping for content and connectivity is key. And you can also cross-sell the content and benefit from connectivity. And we see some examples of that. For example, uh, Vodafone uh, has an agreement with Sony on the PlayStation, precisely which enables the PlayStation to be sold in the Vodafone stores. Um, and there is a Vodafone SIM, a pay-as-you-go SIM included in a pack. And you can top up with Vodafone and you get uh, a game at no extra charge. Looking into the detail of this implementation, and I took the French example of the pack that uh, Sony made with SFR in France. Actually, when you open your uh, PS Vita box, you have the PS Vita and you have a SIM card which is sitting along. It's inside the same box, but it's separate and you have to physically insert the SIM into the device. Um, and then you have three days of free usage that is offered by SFR uh, to try it on uh, on 3G. And after three days, you can top up using SFR voucher codes or you can subscribe uh, with SFR for a monthly uh, subscription and you get a little discount. Uh, as a subsidy to, uh, for the device. So that's uh, clearly um, uh, I mean, a good thing to bundle uh, the connectivity and the device, but it's still seen as two separate decisions because as a user, I will put the SIM into the device to benefit from the free usage. And after my three days, will I top up? Will I throw away the SIM to put another SIM because I happen to be with another operator and I have a better deal? SFR here is providing the SIM, providing the free trial, but not ensured to get the, the traffic and the business afterwards. Another example is looking at Amazon. If you buy the Kindle Touch 3G, it says it's written small prints, but it says that you get free 3G connectivity with it throughout Europe. You can even look at the coverage map which covers uh, Europe. It doesn't say which operator you are on. Uh, it just says that it's free to buy content. And when you look at the terms and conditions more in detail, you see that co the connectivity is free when you buy content from Amazon. So if you download the book, download the uh, uh, whatever content they have, the uh, connectivity is free. But Amazon will charge you for other content if you browse, if you, do, if you use other services than the um, Amazon service, you charge. And you pay to Amazon because in order for the Amazon Kindle to work in the first place, you need an account with Amazon and you have given your payment details at registration. So it's easy for Amazon to bill for this extra uh, usage. And we see here that as an end user, if I have this Kindle, I will use it. And I will not even have to ask myself the question, do I want to subscribe to a mobile offer? It comes with it. It just works. Um, Hence, what does this entitle? If we summarize a bit this uh, customer experience, what we see is uh, consumer devices become more and more connected. That suffice. In the, uh, fact, they will have all Wi-Fi and 3G. The ready-to-go with trial period is essential to get the user started. And we would say not only put a SIM in the pack, but put a SIM, I mean, a truly pre-configured pack with the SIM uh, all working and pre-configured. And it happens that user registration is mandatory more and more on those devices. And you may have already an account with Amazon, with Sony, and it's your second device. So you're not actually creating a new account. You're already retrieving your, current, your existing account with those players. And in that context, to provide the one-stop shop for content and con connectivity is needed to drive user acceptance. And what does it mean, uh, one-stop shop? Is to have a single purchase decision and a single registration. If you, you already have made the choice of buying the device, if you have to come home and one week later think about subscribing to a mobile offer, here there is a, uh, a break into the customer journey uh, and, and, and you lose customers. Uh, and also bundling and cross-selling content and connectivity uh, allows to stimulate usage because it's working, I don't have to register elsewhere, and will limit churn because it's uh, like a multi-play strategy, taking the Amazon example. 
uh, I won't switch mobile operators because I don't have any, uh, I mean, I have only one contact with Amazon uh, and no choice in the um, uh, any mo underlying mobile operator. So it limits churn for that uh, operator. So uh, the, the one-stop shop, which is the single process decision and the single registration, who will front the customer and who uh, is entitled to uh, offer this one-stop shop? It can be the device vendor, it can be the mobile operator. Uh, if it is the device vendor, it's applicable to cases where the device vendor has already registered the customer, including payment details, typically the Amazon case, and the device vendor needs to take on, to agree, to take on uh, more responsibility because he becomes a mobile uh, service provider, taking on the credit risk also for the connectivity and uh, regulatory requirements that comes with it. Uh, and the device vendor can then offer free connectivity for his own service. For example, you buy a book, you don't pay the, uh, the connectivity, the underlying connectivity. And if you do other things, then you pay your connectivity. And the device vendor can then segment these two usage. Um, it's a smooth customer journey, uh, and it is relatively low impact for the underlying MNO because it's a classic uh, MVNO type deal. On the other hand, the other possibility is the mobile operator. Uh, in the Sony Vita example, some of the uh, customers are young people which may not have a credit card at this stage and when they register with the PlayStation network they will register their details but they don't have any payment means so they cannot pay through the Sony uh, network. Well, if I, top up, if I have a SFR uh, SIM card in it, I can top up my SFR and it would be great to buy my Sony content using my mobile credit. And in this case, the customer uh, is paying for content from his mobile account um, uh, and the MNO uh, will then need, so the MNO is uh, charging, the operator is, uh, is, is charging for the account of the uh, vendor and retributing uh, the, the payment. And also if the device vendor wants to segregate saying, well, the connectivity to go to my content is free and the other one, Mr. Customer, you pay, the MNO needs also to segment uh, this. This is a tighter integration because the two uh, offers need to be tightly integrated and it's more like a co-marketing deal. And on the left, uh, the MVNO model translates into this business to business to consumer model where uh, the, MN, the, MN, the MNO gets paid from the device vendor which gets paid only for this usage which is outside of uh, the core services by the end user. In the right uh, model, for the end user it's rather integrated because he pays only to uh, one party for the connectivity and the content. It's a bit more complex to manage behind the scene uh, because the user is paying the MNO. Uh, the service provider is maybe paying also the MNO for that traffic which is linked to his content, which the end user is not paying. And the MNO which is getting the payment, the revenues from the end user need to pay back uh, through a third party billing uh, the device vendor for the actual content. So it's a more complex uh, scenario and a tighter inter integration. So what is the winning model? I guess uh, we don't know. We, I mean, various models will emerge, maybe depending on the customer journey and where is the customer primary account. Uh, and anyway, there is need for flexibility for the operator and the connected device vendor to adapt uh, to the different possible environment. And this is where enabler, enablers can, can help. So that's my talk, if you have some questions. Yes, um, thank you, Bertrand. Any questions for Bertrand, please? Well, that's it, thank you very much. Thank you.